uh, with this, maybe I'll get started with um, our program. Um, maybe I'll first, our keynote speaker is Reese McAteem. I think uh, uh, he's from Waterfall Security. Reese is the lead threat researcher for the annual Waterfall ICS Strive OT threat report and writes frequently on topic of OT and ICS cybersecurity. Being solution focused, he champions INL cyber informed engineering program and regularly provides advice and commentary to government agencies and, standards bo and standard bodies issuing OT security guidance. Reese is a professional engineer with 15 years of industry experience in power generation transmission substation automation, food and beverage plant automation, public and government telecom, data centers, and IT support. He holds a bachelor's of science in electrical engineering from University of Alberta. Reese is a lead threat researcher for the annual waterfall ICS drive uh, OT threat report. You know, Reese, are you here? I think it was a great honor to have you. I know I screwed up your last name, but so forgive me. <laughs> so I appreciate you being here and uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Prakash. <clears throat> Don't worry, everybody messes it up. Even Microsoft Word likes to autocorrect it to machetes, which I like. And then now the new version of Microsoft Word doesn't do that anymore, so I'm very disappointed. Please just give me a second to get set up here. All right, almost there. You should see my very nice slideshow. All right. Um, thank you all. Uh, thank you, uh, Prakash, for the wonderful welcome. Um, my talk today is about attack trends in critical infrastructure and industrial control systems. So <clears throat> uh, my name is Reese. As uh, Prakash said, I'm an electrical engineer, and I've spent many years in industry. And at the beginning of the pandemic, I got my foot in the door and I started working in cybersecurity with Waterfall. Um, my job is to be a subject matter expert for my company. So in that light, I've spent many hours researching threat, cybersecurity threat and how it impacts physical systems. Uh, I like to use the word operational technology, but other people like to use cyber physical systems. To me, they're slightly different, of course, but relatively the same. So I'm going to be using the words OT, operational technology, which, which Gartner coined today in my talk, but I'm talking about the physical things that run our world. And threat researching is a super hot topic right now. Uh, I think, you know, obviously with the current situation we're in, it, it seems quite obvious. Um, and it's quite a lot of fun to look at threats. And ultimately the goal here is to try and understand what kind of attacks we are seeing in order to better defend against them. So I hope you find this talk useful today. All right, a little bit uh, while I start, I am here representing my company. So let's get that out of the way. Um, I'm not, not an academic. Uh, I work for Waterfall. And one of the things we do is we produce physical hardware to protect operational technology and industrial control system networks. Um, we have offices all around the world with a global presence and we sell a whole host of hardware and software combined solutions to protect OT. We've been around since 2007 and um, we're deployed in many key sectors around the world, including in power, oil and gas, rails and other critical infrastructure. <clears throat> so let's go right into the meat and potatoes here of today's talk. Let's talk about what we've been seeing and how we've created our annual threat report is that we've looked at <clears throat> all events since 2010. Um, question for the audience, in 2010, what happened in OT, ICS, cyber physical systems that changed the world? There was an incident that occurred in 2010. Anybody know what it is? Dr. Kim, I think, might have the answer. It's Stuxnet, OK? Stuxnet changed the world. So we had to pick a time-bound limit on our reporting. 
we decided to start with everything that occurred since 2010 and have a look to see how it impacted physical systems. And when we're designing a report, it was really important to be careful about our criteria. There are many, many threat reports out there. Some of them cover thousands of incidents uh, of all kinds. We wanted to be very, very deliberate in how we designed this to make it the most credible, credible report out there. And by credible, meaning the most believable. So we wanted to look only at deliberate attacks, not errors and omissions to industrial control systems, not somebody accidentally pushing the wrong button. We wanted to look at incidents with physical consequences. So that means there's an actual consequence to the attack. It's not an attack that was defended against and nothing happened. These were incidents that caused physical shutdowns, safety incidents or worse. Um, and in focus industries, quite frankly, we, we serve a certain market. So it makes no sense for us personally to talk about healthcare. We really don't know that market very well. So certain industries we have not covered, um, but we've covered anything basically with what you consider a classic control system, PLCs, uh, physical devices, IOT sensors, stuff like this running uh, physical hardware that keeps companies physical operations running. And we wanted to look only at things in the public record. Why? Well, because it just makes no sense to discuss things that are told to us in confidence. We can't have an honest uh, conversation about that because we're just, you know, our hands are tied on, on what we can speak about. And most importantly, we want it to be as transparent as possible. Publish the entire data set at the end of the report. So if you go to waterfall-security.com slash 2024-threat-report, you can go download the report for yourself. And I highly encourage you to do so. We made this report in combination with a partner of ours, uh, Greg Hale at ISSSource.com and ICSStrive.com is a reporter, been covering safety and um, now cybersecurity incidents to businesses for years and uh, great resource. He covers much, much more than we cover because we have a very specific report. Uh, that we just outlined and uh, so highly encourage you to go look at his resources as well if you're a researcher in this space and you're looking for a huge database of incidents all kinds of cybersecurity incidents including ones that impact IT like the CrowdStrike incident that will be in his reporting and not necessarily in ours. Um, <clears throat> here are the conclusions from our latest threat report that we published out in uh, early April. I like to you know being a Canuck from north of the border, I like to call this a hockey stick graph here up on the top right. Um, we've seen a state change in incidents with physical consequences since the beginning of this decade. So, and again, this is all based on public reporting. You could start attacking the numbers and saying, well, you know, you only know what's reported and what you see in the press, that's true. But from what we can tell and what's been seen in the public sphere, this is what we have public source intelligence. And we've been, again, very, very careful and deliberate in our reporting, so the numbers are small, but we project 100 attacks will hit OT or industrial control system networks and have physical consequences by the end of this year. The reporting is based on data up until the end of 2023. <clears throat> now, We've tried to look at other sources of public data to try and give us an idea of whether we're on the right track or whether we're just making stuff up. And uh, one report I really love is the FBI's um, IC3 annual report. They look at things slightly differently, but since uh, 2021, they started tracking incidents to OT networks as well. And so this is a way to have a nice view of public incidents or at least incidents in this case reported to the FBI, um, sorry, not public incidents, incidents reported to the FBI in America um, by people willing to report to the FBI, it shows a similar trend line. It shows an exponential growth. This year, the SEC filing rules, but also other financial filing rules around the world, including in the stock exchange in India, uh, including in the EU, and filing rules um, in Great Britain have kind of changed the way public reporting works around these kind of public incidents. Companies are much less likely to report details on what happened to them after a cyber attack than in the past, for obvious reasons. There are you know, consequences for saying too much and consequences for saying too little. So they're trying to figure that out right now. And uh, I expect that will have an impact on these numbers, something to keep in mind. 
But the key takeaway, exponential growth since the beginning of the decade. Digging through all the attacks that are all in that appendix that we've published, um, we've tried to rank them all by threat actor. First of all, do we know what the threat, who the threat actor was? Uh, can we attribute it to a threat actor? Um, so there is a large chunk of the attacks that are unknown. That's the burgundy reddish color there. Uh, and this is all data since 2010. <clears throat> but of all the attacks that are known, 80% are ransomware should come as no surprise. Uh, interesting fact that number is actually slightly down from last year. We've seen a rise in hacktivist and nation state attacks in the last year, two years. Again, as the geopolitical situation deteriorates around the world, uh, we should be seeing this kind of trend. We're seeing more hacktivist and nation state attacks worldwide. Um, and that unknown chunk is growing this year, and I expect it to continue growing, again, because there are consequences for uh, publicly traded companies, especially around the world, in publishing more details about the attacks that they've suffered. Maybe some of those regulations will change and actually help bring to light more attacks than we've seen in the past, but we just really can't know right now. The future is unwritten. And lastly, when we're on this subject of threat actors, uh, another thing that we've seen uh, that's changed the game a little bit is that we've seen hacktivist, hacktivists and nation states and ransomware groups not directly but indirectly, indirectly leveraging their techniques, tactics, and procedures, the tools that they develop to attack not only IT networks but OT networks are now being bought, sold, traded, and shared amongst these three groups. So there's a synergy developing out there. Um, Microsoft's threat report last year had a nice little quote mentioning that, that these tools, tactics, and procedures are getting traded. Um, is there direct evidence that they're working together? I think the picture is emerging that perhaps there is. Um, it's a little bit nebulous. I like to try and stick to the facts. Um, so I'm going to point to Microsoft's threat research report that came out last year as, as suggesting that. <clears throat> um, attack types. This is a term I made up. What is it? We wanted to try and figure out how OT, how operational networks are being impacted by cyber attacks. This came from feedback from last year when we published our last report. People like yourselves wrote in and said, sure, we're seeing all these attacks, that's great, but how are they occurring? So I went through every single incident and I rated them and I tried to find out, were they directly impacting operational technology, industrial control systems? Were they indirectly impacting them? Why were they shutting down? Why were we seeing physical consequences? And here's the conclusion. So for, for the attacks where we can uh, find some attribution as to, as to the attack type, um, the big conclusion here is that most attacks, which are ransomware, 80% in this case, are indirectly impacting industrial control systems and operational physical operations. This is an interesting conclusion, and it's actually about two thirds. Two thirds is a large number. So yes, we're seeing especially hacktivist and nation state attacks directly going after OT. But the majority of attacks we're seeing are in an abundance of caution. We couldn't be sure that our physical operations were safe to run, so we shut them down. Colonial Pipeline is a prime example. That's one of those in that data set. Abundance of caution, we shut it down. Sometimes it's in their procedures. It's part of their procedure, standard operating procedure. We don't know if an attack is gonna penetrate into our operational networks. We've got firewalls, we've got cybersecurity, we might even have unidirectional gateways or other data diodes, we just don't know, can't be sure, CEO makes the call. It might even be written into the NOC, SOC, or other uh, operational centers, procedures. You've got an operator sitting at a console and his job's to push the big mushroom button if you aren't sure if the attack got in or not. And dependencies. Dependencies are another massive one. CrowdStrike was not a cyber attack, but it illustrated that when you're dependent on other software services, systems, technology, if those are impacted by a cyber attack and your physical operations rely 
on that technology to run, you're going to shut down. And that was one third of all the tax that we were able to rate. Industries. <clears throat> Again, we don't cover all industries in our report. We're very clear about that. But here are the ones that we do cover. We've decided to split things up into discrete and process manufacturing. Discrete manufacturing is we're going to make a car. We're going to take components that are already manufactured, assemble them into a larger whole. Process manufacturing is we've got chemicals, we've got stuff, goo that we're going to turn into an end product. We're going to make a plastic jug today, a water bottle. Um, by and large, manufacturing throughout the world has suffer suffered the largest impact from cyber attacks in our data set. What else have we got here? Um, <clears throat> a lot of water treatment. Not a lot of power, actually. Um, I think power is probably well protected. You tend to see a lot of these physical impacts in industries where perhaps the cybersecurity protection isn't yet at the level that is needed. Geographies. We went through, we looked at every incident, and it, it's, it gets tricky with multinational companies to figure out which geography should we place them into. We tried as much as possible to be as real as we can. So if an incident impacts, let's say like Bridgestone was attacked by ransomware, and they shut down all plants throughout North and South America, that's a tough one to attribute to. We ended up just putting United States as um, the country in that geography because for the most part, most plants that went down in that incident were in the United States. In other cases, um, we've tried to put the headquarters of that organization um, into our category to come up with a geographical statistic. But everything is all transparent, so all the data is there. You can go and have a look at the incidents and the countries impacted. And one of the things we're seeing without any big surprise is that the United States, Canada and Germany are trading always every single year for the top three spot in having the most impacts from cyber attack. Why? Um, my speculation, I think it's fairly straightforward, is, is that this is where most of the world's goods are manufactured and where most of the industrial base is concentrated. And uh, most of the other countries around in uh, the top seven here are also related to this. G7 countries and industrialized nations um, that produce some of the world's best technology and products are being heavily impacted by this. Uh, however, keep in mind that we can't report on things that aren't public. And in certain countries, certain information is not made public. We just don't know what has happened to them and whether they have been impacted by cyber attacks. So keep that in the back of your head. But this is what we've got for attributable attacks. High profile ransomware incidents. There are a lot of them. <laughs> um, last year, Greg and I sat down and looked at the financial numbers. So keep in mind that very few companies publish financial numbers in terms of the actual cost of the attack. Usually they're companies uh, that are publicly traded, so they must report. And now the SEC filings and other filings around the world, London Stock Exchange, uh, Stock Exchange in Mumbai and India, et cetera, now are starting to publish these figures and we're getting a better picture of what's going on. However, it's still very rare to actually find incidents where we can see a financial cost. Uh, it's getting even more rare now as time goes forward to see um, some admission of downtime. Even downtime is, uh, the reporting is getting pulled back a little bit. But downtime also matters. So you can kind of figure out an estimate of how much an organization lost by the amount of downtime they suffered as well. So examples here from last year, Dole, food and beverage, four sites were hit around the world. Um, combined 16 million in, uh, including restoration costs that came directly from their SEC filing, um, led to spoiled food, food shortages across the United States. Granules India, a pharmaceutical manufacturer, um, in a national stock exchange filing in India, reported a significant loss, uh, lost 40 days of production. I believe if you actually go back and look at their reports, by the end of the year, they recovered their losses. And so I actually reported they didn't lose anything, but they initially reported a $40 million, um, sorry, 
they didn't have a number on that, a significant loss. That was their exact words in their NSC filing. MGM Resorts. This is one that we actually were not going to put in our report. Why? Because we're very strict about our reporting and we weren't really sure how to count this. Uh, they're a casino and what went down? Effectively, their building management systems completely went down because they were dependent on cloud managed services. Um, there are stories of people walking through the hotels and all MGM's properties in Las Vegas and all the doors were simply just all unlocked. Their control systems were all their building management control systems were all tied into the cloud. And so when they lost cloud services, they lost everything, including the ability for the front desk to issue key cards and make sure that their properties were secure. So we counted it because we count building management control systems. If it wasn't for that, we wouldn't be counting. Things like uh, business, what I call business consequences, not being able to bill or charge customers at the front desk, we don't count. That's, we see that more of as an IT and a business consequence thing, which it matters but that's not our focus of our reporting. We counted it because of the building management control systems. And there's more, MKS Instruments makes uh, really high-end tooling for chip manufacturers. Um, they're not the biggest tooling manufacturer for companies like TSMC in the world, but they are very, very important. Massive loss here because not only they lost 200 million revenue, but Another company that they supply with their tooling also lost 250 million as a result. So the combined incident here impacted two organizations, just a phenomenal amount of money. I, I saw a great report in Security Week this week. I pushed it out on my LinkedIn because I thought it was great, claiming that well, we're now seeing you know million dollar impacts. Uh, yes, um, but we're seeing this too. Uh, half a billion is now becoming commonplace. Let's, uh, we talked a lot about this, let's move on to the next slide. Uh, supply chain attacks. This is something that has, we've seen a resurgence of in 2024. Um, NotPetya is probably a classic example of a supply chain attack where you've got Ukrainian tax package software that accidentally malware just gets spread throughout even more computers because it uh, spread externally. Um, haven't seen many for quite a while and they've come back in our data set by the end of 2023. Some of the ones that I saw that were quite um, interesting to me, I hope they're interesting to you, because there's something new uh, that you may not be thinking about, um, were three. Polish Rail uh, accuses a supplier of rail cars, a new ag SA, of sabotaging um, the rail stock that they have purchased from new ag. Um, what happened? Basically, they complained that there was a firmware time bomb inserted um, that would prevent them from repairing their own trains in their own yard. So they bought these, this rail stock from Newag, they brought it into Polish Rail, they've got them in the train yard and they're trying to service this equipment and basically um, they find that they can no longer move their rolling stock anymore. The firmware inside has noticed that they're not going to an authorized service provider, which is the manufacturer, and has killed all their trains. They, I see this as actually a cyber attack. It's a code inserted into firmware, into systems that basically prevent them from working properly. Now, we could go on and on about John Deere and other manufacturers playing similar games, uh, but this is a supply chain attack. You've now put firmware throughout your entire supply chain that um, leads to physical consequences. We have rolling stock that's no longer moving out of train yards after maintenance. Orca FPV headsets, very, very small company, a startup. Um, they make immersive VR headsets, uh, whether for hobby use or military, allow you to basically see first person view of what your drone sees as it flies around the skies. Um, basically their software supplier that they partnered with in the same co-working space locally. And I believe um, they're in Hungary, if I'm not mistaken, but it's in a report, uh, basically has sabotaged the firmware. Another time bomb attack where after a certain number of days, the headsets no longer function. Unless of course you pay a bunch of money <laughs> to the software developer who feels he got screwed by his business partner. And anyway, so uh, a unique example of a supply chain attack. And third, the CrowdStrike, uh, CrowdStrike, you know, everybody's talking about it. It's not a cyber attack. The most important thing here is that this occurred in the last year and shows what happens when you're dependent, as I said, um, on other people's products and services to run your physical operations. You lose entire airline operations because every endpoint has 
CrowdStrike services deployed. And I'm sure that this will continue to happen as people reach out more into the cloud and leverage those services. Um, it's important to always remember when you're designing systems, think about your dependencies. This was another massive problem that's been happening all around the world in two major locations. One is around the general area in the North Sea and uh, Northern Europe, and also in the Middle East. GPS jamming and spoofing has become a massive problem. If you rely on any kind of satellite navigation to run your physical operations, you will probably be feeling some kind of impact. Anything from transportation, shipment of goods, uh, logistics, to commercial shipping, commercial aircraft, uh, including military, um, is being impacted by this. Now, what is this? GPS jamming has been around an extremely long time. There's no guarantee that the GPS system that was developed decades ago will continue to work in your car if you drive down the street in a conflict zone. That was deliberate in a sense. The original system was designed for military use, but enabled uh, as a low resolution access for, for civilian use as well. And now we all use it and we use it for everything. Um, your Lyft ride, your Uber ride, whatever, you know, and just getting your food to your house, your coffee in the morning gets delivered. And without GPS, those systems will completely fail. And what's happening is uh, even worse than jamming where you've got the radio frequency being uh, attacked in a particular zone is spoofing. Now, what is this? It's deliberately malformed messages. You know, you've got a satellite up in the sky, it's going to be sending messages back down to your device. If a stronger signal between you and the satellite is now inserting bad information, we're now starting to see aircraft, for example, saying, um, you know, I'm flying legally in my lane, when in fact they're 200 miles outside in a hostile territory. Uh, because their computer on board the navigation of their aircraft doesn't know any different. This is a very big problem when you're flying over certain countries in the world, especially when there are conflict zones. And car thieves. I mean, I was up at Sector in Toronto last year. Some of the people at booths selling cybersecurity services were telling me that, oh yeah, you know, my brand new Toyota I just got delivered last week vanished from my driveway in the morning. Um, the bottom line is when you're dependent on systems, you have to think about how they can impact your physical operations. And a huge near miss was uh, a big talk was um, an attack on critical infrastructure in Denmark. Sector Cert is an organization um, that basically is kind of a members group of all the critical infrastructure in Denmark. They have sensors deployed throughout networks in Denmark looking for attacks, and they noticed a massive attack last year. And were able to marshal enough resources and get out there and stop that attack in progress before it got into operational systems. So this was a near miss. Uh, we don't count this in a report as one of our attacks, 68 attacks that we saw in 2023. We consider this a near miss but very important to talk about. Um, they're seeing all these attacks uh, in waves coming through their sensors and physically driving out to sites, getting their members involved um, to try and stop this attack on their network. One of the things that they did, which was really amazing, is they wrote everything up and they freely published it. So you can go and download their report on the series of attacks that they saw very important to know about. And kudos to them for publishing it all so that we can learn. Um, can't talk about 2024 without mentioning Volt Typhoon, especially when you're involved in protecting critical infrastructure. This has not only got people here in this country afraid, all of America's allies, of course, are also very, very concerned about this. Um, I'm not sure if I need to say much about this. I assume that most of you have already heard about this. Um, but this is something that I think everybody should know about. The idea that Microsoft discovered these attackers living off the land and hiding stealthily in operational networks, in critical infrastructure, 
throughout private companies that it, with supply and service agreements to the United States government is extremely concerning. And the fact that they, it looks like they had been there for years beforehand and only been accidentally discovered uh, because finally somebody noticed an anomaly is extremely concerning. We hear from our governments that they have searched all their networks and excised and removed all the cancer. Have they? We don't know. <laughs> That's the nature of the living off the land attacks, you know, using tools in place and operating systems and in networks that already exist to your advantage, not bringing in external malware that can be detected by things like uh, CrowdStrike's products is extremely concerning. So uh, in summary, please add me on LinkedIn, follow me. Uh, we're gonna be publishing a new report very shortly in Q1 2025, based on data up until the end of this year. Um, I would love for you to download our report waterfall-security.com slash 2024-threat-report. Please send me your feedback. Uh, we've worked very hard on this. It's designed to be a resource for everybody in the cybersecurity community, especially in OT and ICS and CPS, and we would very much like your feedback. Thank you very much for your time today. Now we can take questions. So. Can you raise your hand if you have questions so we can, yes. Anytime, anytime we could attribute the ransomware to a certain group um, with some credibility, sometimes it's hard to do, but whenever I was quite sure that we knew, yes, I put it in my report, uh, there's a giant table in Appendix A, go download the report, and you'll find it there. If you think I'm wrong, please send me an email and I will, you know, send me what you've got and I would love to correct it. Again, I don't have any problem going back on a record and correcting things. Um, I find that an extremely important question. Has there been any trends? A little bit. I mean, the usual suspects are out there and a lot of people have written many reports about those threat actor groups, but I have tried to attribute them, yes. So, um, so are you guys connected to any threat sharing platforms? And if the answer is yes, is like the second part of my question is, are you part of any rule writing procedure as well or no? So no, it's actually quite difficult to do this kind of research. Very few platforms out there or resources online or databases that I've found specifically focus on OT networks and things that our customers care about um, and on physical consequences. We've partnered with Greg's organization because he does have an online database and um, he's added some filters and so on that help us, um, for example, select only OT attacks and ones with physical consequences. But in terms of threat sharing platforms, uh, we do belong to some. Some of them we're not allowed to talk about. We've signed NDA agreements. So it gets a little bit dicey. So, uh, but uh, if you've heard of any, you think that would be directly applicable to this use case, which is OT with physical impacts, I'm all ears. I'd be interested in signing up for any that would help me basically accelerate this research and make sure I don't miss any incidents. All right, thank you. More questions, any questions, any more? Thank you very much. I um, have done a lot of work with OT on the defense side. So that's kind of where my background is. And we obviously work very, very close with CISA. And so I'm curious, because I've done multiple presentations on the cybersecurity of the IT of the OT um, in, in Sweden recently. And it's something that we've talked about. And I hadn't heard about this. So I'm really appreciative and really followed kind of your cases that you've been talking about. But just curious then, uh, talking about the relationship with the government entities, which largely would be CISA, who has the national responsibility for that. Like, what can you just talk a little bit about that relationship? And if there is any, and if not, um, is it just because we're a private industry and we're really looking at it from a, like a cybersecurity perspective, separate from government impacts? Just curious your thoughts on that. Um, Waterfall's always been well connected at CISA. Uh, we often speak, uh, not necessarily me personally, but um, my boss Andrew Ginter does often. 
Um, we collaborate as closely as possible. Um, being a Canadian, you can see by my poppy here, it's almost Remembrance Day on November 11th coming up soon. Um, we're connected with our government as well. Uh, we, from as, as a private company, we work very, very closely with governments around the world, including in Nordic countries, including in the EU. And uh, you know, while we sell product that protects OT systems, and you can come see me at my booth after, and we can talk all about it. Um, <clears throat> CIS's mandate has, has changed a little bit, but not really. I mean, in terms of their focus, they seem much more focused now on software vulnerabilities, which is great. There's a lot of software vulnerabilities. I think the NVD has like 17,000 backlogged uh, vulnerabilities. That's what I've heard in the news anyway. So there's a lot of work to be done. Um, the focus has changed a little bit. It used to be that there was more focus on protecting operational technology and industrial control systems. And this is normal. You know, you have a change in focus uh, depending on uh, where the needle is moving. And so um, while we're very, very focused on protecting OT with physical hardware and the, the, the shift has changed more into the software side, um, we've always been collaborating and we're always looking at collaborate, uh, anything we can, we can bring to the table to help uh, defend critical infrastructure, uh, not only for private industry, but for government is important to us. Thank you. Questions? Any more questions? I have a question. Is your threat report is available for public on your website or is it uh, accessible? Okay, for what is your advice for students? Since more students are listening for this conference, you know, in terms of OT, what do you want to uh, provide some thought as, as you're closing? Um, I really missed my time at university. I, I had a fantastic time. I, I grew up in the early 2000s, the world was changing. Facebook was new, sucked me in, Gmail too. Um, great services, uh, and cloud was becoming a new thing, and now we've seen that evolve. Um, the hacker community and uh, cybersecurity is not a new field. I remember being at a cyber awareness training event at my company, and got a room filled with amazing people, all dedicated to protecting OT, all cybersecurity experts, programmers, developers, managers, and everybody in between. And we've got this young lady in front of us, you know, trying to remind us not to get fished. She asks a question. She's like, just trivia question, you know, what's the one movie about a kid with, you know, a modem in his basement and he dials into NORAD and, you know, steals a video game? And I couldn't believe that nobody in the room knew the answer to that question. Does anybody know which movie I'm talking about? Yes? Yeah, so maybe it's because we all grew up in that era and we watched these movies like Sneakers and Hackers and it changed our lives. Um, but what I want to say to the young students in the room is this is not a new field and it's really vast and there are a lot of different things you can do. And I want you to keep an open mind and open perspective. Uh, go and watch those old corny movies that we all grew up with and get a sense of, of where we were and where we're going and, uh, and, and enjoy the ride. It's an amazing field to be in. And it, as a Gen Xer, you know, it makes me feel really good when I go home at night and I'm like, yeah, I saved the world. You know, I deployed another gateway or I delivered another presentation and I made somebody think differently. So think about that. Uh, we're in that space now and it's an amazing place to be. And of course, um, remember that we're here trying to defend systems and change the world and that we don't want to see conflict. Uh, that's why we do what we do, because if we can stop an attack from happening, we're all better off for it. Thank you. Ah, one more question. Hello. Sorry, here. Um, have you, uh, does Waterfall or you uh, work on providing like reference architectures and designs, especially surrounding legacy ICS, OT, CPS uh, uh, systems such as Modbus, Modbus over IP, and other things that were designed in the 70s and 80s that where security wasn't even a thought? Yeah, so that's all we do. That's why our company, a genesis for a company, was, was created, was to protect legacy systems. Um, please come and see me at the waterfall booth at the back or say hi to me if you meet me today and ask me about that. Um, we also do cloud stuff too. Um, so we're trying to cover the whole breadth. But 
we have many reference architectures. In fact, we're giving away a free book. It's written by Andrew. Um, he's my boss. He's been in the industry for decades. He's tried to put all the knowledge he's gained over the years uh, into a self-published book. And um, he just wants to share that with the community. Um, so come grab a book. It's filled with reference architectures and ideas of how you might protect operational systems. Uh, Andrew and I are both big on the cyber informed engineering thing from the Department of uh, Energy and Idaho National Labs. And so a lot of the concepts um, from that program, which is brand new, are in the book. Reference architectures and ideas about how to protect OT is, is all there. And our company has always published many uh, diagrams, use cases, and et cetera, et cetera, uh, to help our customers out integrate our products into their uh, systems. Or if you want to use an alternative, uh, you know, it's freely available. Any more questions? If not, let's thank the speaker, Reese, for his time. Appreciate it. Thank you, Reese, for your time. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you and Waterfall has been a great support for the CAR Symposium even last year. And there is free books for students or anybody on engineering great security at their desk in or their booth. So I encourage highly to grab that uh, second new version that's been released. You know, we have a lot of books there. So that's something, a good resource for you to familiarize with OT.